because the shoulder moves when you breathe. Yeah, sure. When you're breathing, the shoulder's going to move. Okay, so we're going to give breathing instructions. So in the past, we really haven't given any type of breathing instructions except when we're discussing uh, <coughs> cross thoracic. So when you're shooting the proximal humerus in any of these areas here, including the clavicle and the other joints, now the instructions that we're going to give our patient is not only do, you, do we not want them to move, but we're also going to have them hold the breath. Hold the breath. Now, naturally, uh, with patients who have had many x-rays, when you tell them to hold the breath, naturally what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to take a deep breath in. <clears throat> so taking their deep breath in can be problematic because once you center it onto the shoulder and they take a deep breath in, what happened to my centering? It's off. It's now off. So when you ask your patient to hold their breath, instruct them to just hold their breath right at that point. There's no need for them to take a deep breath in. Just stop when you tell them to stop. So these are the things that you're going to go over during your dialogue. Ms. Jones, <coughs> in a moment here, we're going to be taking a picture of your x-ray. When I hold <coughs> your breath, I just want you to simply to hold your breath. No need to take a deep <coughs> breath in. I just hold your breath. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> just stop breathing. Just stop breathing. Okay. Hold still. Don't move. Hold your breath. Just hold your breath. Don't breathe or don't move. Okay. Okay. That's it. Exposure factors. Bless you. Okay. So it's going to be around the <laughs> low to mid range for the shoulder. Again, when you're going from the elbow to humerus to the shoulder, that's going to get a little bit thicker, right? So we're going to use a slightly higher KV than we would use for our elbow. This is what we're doing. <coughs> um, so around what? Around the around 60, 65. 60, 65. Your book has been telling you plus or minus 70. Mm -hmm. Okay. It all depends, again, on the type of equipment that you're using. So it's going to be like the high 60s, mid 70s, maybe around the 80s. Short exposure times. What is the whole purpose of short exposure times? That's motion. To minimize what? Motion. Minimize motion. Uh, we'll talk about center cell here in a little bit. Um, this is the use of an AEC or an automatic <coughs> exposure control. Did Miss Smith discuss an AEC with you guys yet? Not yet. No, yes. Okay. She's, she she spoke of it. She's gonna go over it next week. Next week, okay. Yeah. So then I'm not gonna spend any time on it now. So it'll be covered next week on her lecture. But simply, what an AEC is, it's an automatic exposure control. That's what it stands for. <laughs> so instead of you saying your MA in time, it automatically sets it for you based on the thickness of the body part. So when you're making the exposure behind the bucky, we have ionization chambers, ion chambers that detects the amount of radiation going through the patient's body and interacting with the chamber. Once that chamber has received enough exposure, it terminates the exposure for you. So the only thing that you're going to be adjusting is KV. So it's basically the poor man's, lazy man's <coughs> way of shooting an x-ray. And that's what we're trying to discourage you guys from doing because we want you to think. Okay? And understand what KV, ME, and time are for. That's what AEC is, okay? Um, cassettes. Okay, are we going to do tabletop or are we going to do bucky or are we going to use grids? Yes. All of them? All of the above. Yes, yeah, so all of the above. So it depends on what your situation is. Now, how do you know whether to use just a regular image receptor or an image receptor with a grid? If it's in the bucket or not. Okay. Well, what is KV based? I mean, what is the grid based on? Body part, 10 centimeters or more, right? <coughs> so when you guys go out in the field and you're having your tech shooting shoulders, let's just say it's trauma and you're shooting a shoulder in, uh, in the emergency room, okay? And the patient can't come down. So they're going to place the image receptor be, be behind the patient you will see two different practices. One with an image receptor without a grid, and the top technology is using an image receptor with a grid. It's all on preference. 
because the shoulder is one of those anatomical structures that's borderline. So you can either use grid or no grid. And they're both correct. Does that make sense? Now, if, if they come to our department, I'm definitely going to use the bucket because the image just looks a lot better. Okay, because the bucket grid is what cleans up all the scatteration, giving you a better image. Okay, small focal spot. Why? Better detail. Better detail. Better detail. Okay. All right. Uh, source to image distance. Again, most of our distances are done at 40 inch SID, with the exception of the AC joint. And we'll talk about the AC joint towards the end of our presentation. <coughs> the AC joint, we generally do it at the distance of 72 inches. But most studies are going to be done at 40. So if they're standing up, if they are standing up, it's going to be 72 inches, right? Yes. You won't be able to achieve 72 inches if the patient's on the table. <coughs> and you don't do AC joints on the table anyway. And I'll explain why. So if you're doing AC joints, the, the patient is, uh, they need to be standing for this. And this is where you can get that 72 inches. Okay, but I'll explain it here just a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about the two views of the shoulder. Clean and simple. Okay, you place your patient up on the image receptor. Yes? For testing purposes, should we do 72 inches or 40 inches? Okay, um, for which one? For the AC joint. Oh, I'll tell you later on. I'll tell you later on. Okay. All right, so for the shoulder, there's only two positions. Okay, and you don't have to move the patient at all. So you're going to direct your central ray a couple of inches right below the coracoid process. Okay, I'll get to the specifics here in just a little bit. We have two views. Patient is in this position. Center rate is going to be right at the scapulohumeral joint, which is located a few inches below the coracoid process, so right about here. The simplest way to do this is put your central ray where the arm attachment is. Okay, that's the simplest way. Okay, so right about here. Two projections, AP, okay, AP, what am I feeling for in an AP? Epicondyles. Epicondyles, and they are what? Parallel. Parallel, Parallel to the image receptor, okay? Hold still, don't move, beep. Come back in, change the image receptor. I'm not moving the patient. All I'm doing now is rotating their arm. <coughs> this is AP internal rotation. And now how am I placing the epicondyles? Perpendicular. Perpendicular. Perpendicular to the image receptor. So AP, palms facing forward, okay, in a true AP. In an internal rotation, now I'm going to rotate the hand inward, so the thumb is pointing posteriorly, placing the epicondyles perpendicular to the image receptor. And that gives you the lateral view? This gives you the lateral of the shoulder. <coughs> okay. So you literally can do shoulders in less than a minute. Say that now. When you get as good as me. <laughs> okay. But literally, you can do it less than a minute. AP, click, change the cassette, internal rotation, beep, and they're done. There's hardly any rotation <coughs> at all. It's just all arm rotation. Okay. So here's your AP. External rotation, this is your true AP, and your epicondyles are in true parallel with the image receptor. Arms are out partially abducted with the palms facing forward. Okay, like so. Central is going to be a few inches. Okay, so it's one inch inferior to the coracoid process. I just say just look for the arm attachment. Look where the arm attaches. Okay, and that's where your central ray is going to be directed. But I will show you guys the exact way of how to palpate the coracoid process, and you're going to go slightly below that. Okay? All right. What else do we have here? Grid versus no grid. We talked about that earlier. Now, you're going to use a small cassette. The cassette generally is going to be placed crosswise. Okay? Not lengthwise, but crosswise. Not portrait, but landscape. Okay. The reason why we put it crosswise is we also want to include as much of what structure in the radiograph? 
Okay, not only we're looking at this, but what else do we want to include in there? Clavicle. The clavicle. So if you place it in this orientation, <coughs> you can get the shoulder, and you can also get the sternal end of the clavicle. Now, with that said, it depends on the protocol of your facility. Okay? For the most part, we do it crosswise. Other facilities do it lengthwise, and they don't care about the sternal end. Okay? So again, what we're doing here is we're giving you the foundation. What they do, what they say to do, you do. Okay? It's not a what about Mr. F. It's not about what Ms. Smith has said. You do what they tell you to do. Okay? <coughs> All right, breathing instructions. Hold your breath. Hold your breath, and what else? Don't move. Okay, so breathing instructions, and also you're going to tell them not to move. So <coughs> hold your breath, don't move, you're leaving the room. Are you keeping your eye on them? Yes. Yes, you're keeping your eye on them. All right? There's also this image here with the patient being shielded. Why are we shielding the patient even though we're shooting the shoulder? Scatter. Okay, so scatter radiation, also peace of mind. Okay, just get in the habit of shielding everybody. Okay, and if you're shielding a patient in <coughs> Texas, why are you shielding them? Okay, and you take the shield away, are you going to contest it? Nope. No. no. Okay, my bad. Yeah, no. <laughs> yes? Do you have to worry about the thyroid? Do I have to worry about the thyroid? Not in this case. You see that a lot of the uh, studies that we do, even though we're sh uh, shooting the thoracic and shoulder girdle area, they're not going to put a thyroid shield on them. Yeah, they just won't. Because there's always that chance of that shield getting in the way of the view. And then if it does, then you end up having to repeat it, and now you double expose the patient. So it's best that they get a little bit of exposure and do it once, instead of twice the exposure because you did it wrong. All right, so here we have a, all right, so here we have a true AP, external rotation of the shoulder. The greater tubercle is going to be in profile. So this is the best visualization. This view is the best visualization <coughs> for the greater tuberosity or the greater tubercle. Okay. The greater tubercle is going to be laterally and also superiorly. The lesser is not going to be in view and will be projected over the head of the humerus. Okay. So the greater tubercle is in profile and the lesser tubercle is going to be superimposed over the head. Okay. <coughs> Questions? And so this is how we know the patient's in the true, true AP. Now, if we go here, now this is the internal rotation. Okay, again, we didn't move our patient. All we're doing now is just, we're just moving the arm. So from here, we're gonna rotate it medially until the thumb is back and the pinky's pointing forward, okay? <coughs> but simply rotating their arm you have to do something else than just rotate their arm. What else are you going to feel for? Epicondyles. Epicondyles and placing them perpendicular, perpendicular with the image separate, okay? Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Everything stays the same. You're just going to have them immediately rotate their arm, okay? So once you do that, hold still, don't move, hold your breath, <coughs> make an exposure. Again, in the meanwhile, <coughs> You're going to keep your, uh, your patient in the line of view and make sure that they're following your directions. Okay? Don't assume they're following your directions. You've got to watch them. Okay? So as you're leaving the room getting ready to make an exposure, you're keeping an eye on them. You shut the door and are also going to watch them through the window. Okay? You want to maintain the line of view, the line of sight. Okay? All right. So here now, the greater tubercle will be superimposed over the head, and the lesser tubercle, or tuberosity, would be projected medially. So this view is great for demonstrating, this is uh, great for demonstrating the lesser tubercle. Now how can you tell the difference between internal rotation and external rotation? 
Can you guys tell the difference? Okay. I'm going to give you guys a quick tip on how they look because there is a difference in appearance. You guys ready? You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. When it is an AP external rotation, it's going to look like almost like a drumstick. This is how the head's going to look. Okay, something like this. When it's an internal rotation, it's going to look like a Q-tip. So you actually have a small bump on one of the sides, whereas in an internal rotation, you have equal roundness on each side. Here, there's a slight bump to it. So let's take a look. Okay, so this is your external rotation. When you do your internal rotation, it's going to be some equal roundness on each side, looking like a Q-tip. Do you guys know what a Q-tip is? Yeah, yeah, you want to assume. Everybody knows what a Q-tip is. <laughs> okay. So it's more round in shape. Round in shape, a little bit of a bump. Okay? Yeah. If you visualize the greater tuberosity, you can visualize the lesser tuberosity. Okay? <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay, those are your two basic views of, of the, the, the shoulder. Now, some institutions will incorporate a different type of view. So you have your AP, external internal rotation, but they also may do a special type of lateral, which we sh showed you earlier, which was like the infra superior type of view. But I have some other views to show you here in a moment. So your other special views, again, the key here is non-trauma, non-trauma, you have the infra superior axial projection, also known as the Lawrence method, named after the physician who invented this view. Then you have the superior inferior PA transaxillary projection. So here we have <coughs> bottom up, right? We're going from the bottom up. Superior inferior, how do you think that projection is? Top down. Top mm -hmm. to bottom, okay? Transaxillary projection, this is the Hobbes modification. And then we'll talk about the Clements and then the superior inferior axial projection. They all obtain the same views. Okay? But how you acquire those views <coughs> will vary slightly, but they all produce the same views. Okay? So here is the inferior superior axial lateral. All right? Patient is supine. They're laying on their back. You are going to first, and it doesn't matter what order you do this, you can either set up your tube first and then set up your cassette, or you can put the cassette first and set up your tube. It doesn't matter what order you do it, just as long as you do it. Okay, there's no exact order. So here we have, we're going to set up our central ray first. So we're going to have first our patient lay down on their back, arms fully abducted, palm facing up. Okay, so they'll be laying down like this, palm up. You guys with me so far? Okay. You're going to place a bolster underneath the shoulder because anything that's close to the edge of the image receptor, the divergent beam is going to throw it off. So anything close to the edge of the image receptor will throw the anatomy off. Does that make sense? It projects it off the screen, off the image receptor. So you want to get the body part as close to the image, the center of the image receptor as possible. And this is why we have to lift them up. Okay. Now, now we're going to set up an <coughs> X-ray tube. Again, doesn't matter what order you do this, but first patient, patient position, laying down, arm abducted, palm up. We're going to set up our central ray, so it's going 25 to 30 degrees medially. What, means, what that means is that 
here is your patient laying down. Okay, they're laying down. In your x-ray tube, your x-ray is going to first match this angulation. Okay, this is your patient. Okay, this is your central ray. So from the parallel, matching the parallelness, I'm making up words, matching the parallelness of this patient, you're gonna go in approximately 20, what does it say? 20 25 to 30 degrees <coughs> from parallel. And now you're going this way towards the axillary of the patient. So this is what's happening here. So here's your patient, and my tube is going to, from parallel of the patient, is going to 25 to 30 degrees towards the axillary. All right? So just direct your central ray right at the arm attachment. Okay, right in the middle of the armpit. Okay? What's the SID for these? SID is always going to be 40 inches. Oh, okay. You always try to get it at 40 inches. Okay, so you get it at 40 inches. Now because of this angulation, we're not going to go into that, well, I angle it 20, 30 degrees, so I'm going to put it in, what, another five or six inches, forget about that for the moment, okay? Just angle your tube and get it at 40 inches, all right? So you angle your tube, and then you're going to take your image receptor, and you're going to place it above the shoulder, getting it as far <coughs> in as you can, because now we're going this way, Okay, you're gonna look at your central ray. The center of your, okay, remember your crosshairs. The crosshairs have to be demonstrated on the image receptor. If you don't push that cassette in far enough, the central <laughs> ray will be right at the edge of your image receptor. So you wanna get as much of it in there in the field light as much as possible. Is that making sense so far? So to do that, not only are you going to place it by their neck, but you also want them to Turn the head so you can place the cassette in even deeper. <coughs> okay? And to know whether or not you are, you are within the image receptor, again, open up your light field to see the crosshairs. If you're not seeing crosshairs, you're not, you're not on the image receptor. crosshairs of your of your light field. Oh. You've got to be able to see the crosshairs on your light field, of the light field on your image receptor. If you don't see it, you're not striking the image receptor. The body part will not be included. And now if I show you an image, this is why you've got to get as much of the cassette in there, because look how close this is to the edge of that image receptor. You've got to shove that cassette in there as much as you can to include the entire anatomy. Okay, so here the lesser tubercle is going to be uh, in profile anteriorly. So this is the lesser tubercle right here. You sure? Yeah, why not? Okay, the humeral head and the glenoid fossa are in profile. You see the shadow of the acromion <clears throat> projected within the head of the humerus. And then you have the other process. What's that other process there? Coracoid process. Coracoid process. Okay. And the bottom is the, the spine. The, right? the, the, this is the, the spine, right? This is the spine right here. Yeah. Because it extends towards the chromium. Here's your chromium and then your spine. Now, would you be doing this if this patient has major trauma to their arm? Mm -hmm. okay. Again, these are non trauma views. If it's traumatic, you're not going to have them do this, nor can they do this. But if they can, okay, don't force it because you're going to cause more problems. You might break something else. Well, Were you waving at me? Or you have <laughs> would, we do a, would we do a transthoracic then for this trauma? I'll, I'll talk about that. Oh, okay. What would we be looking at for like... What are we looking at here? Yeah, like why... Why, why are we doing this? Because we're looking at... The, we're looking at the specific um, relationship between the head and the glenoid fossa. So that's what we're looking at. It's that relationship between the head, the scapula femoral joint. Well, we'll talk about transthoracic in a minute. Okay, now here we have the uh, alternate position, which is an exaggerated rotation of the hand. Okay, so remember, 
The first one was just palm up. Now we're going to have them exaggerated. Pinky up, thumb down. So we're hyper rotating this. And this is good for evaluating the heel sex defect. The heel sex defect is a compression fracture of the articular surface of the posterior lateral humeral head that is often associated with an anterior dislocation. Yay. Okay. So believe it or not, even though they may have a heel sex defect, they're still able to move their arm freely with no problem. Okay. So we can acquire this particular view. I think I have a picture of one here. Okay. Um, so here's a heel sex defect. See that depression right at the head? There's a depression of the humeral head. And usually a heel sex has depression also associated with a slight dislocation. It stays in blue. What happens is, <coughs> what happens is, when we look at the, see there's a sharp edge to the glenoid fossa, right? Okay? So, what happens is that it dis gets dislocated, and then when it pops back in, it scrapes off or takes a chunk of the humeral head. Okay? But again, they may be in pain, but they can freely move their arm because it's back on the socket. Okay? Now that you have that de depression, okay, it's a defect and we, and we can remain that way. So now there's a tendency for that arm to <coughs> pop, in out, pop in and out of that joint on a continuous basis. Okay? All right, so this is, this is a very tough projection to acquire, but we are going to practice this during lab. But the more simpler ones are is something like this. This is the Hobbs. So we just have the patient just going up on the image receptor and just putting their arm up. Or they're laying down on the table with their arms stretched out. That looks a lot easier to do, right? Less work. And the, the central rate is all perpendicular. Okay? No angulation, less complication. Remember what they say, work smarter, not harder. So this is one of the smarter moves, is the hops. Okay? So where do you think the central ray is directed on this? Joint. Right at the joint. You can see where the joint is, right? You can see where the joint is, right at the arm joint, scapulohumeral joint. Okay, so this is the Hobbs, Hobbs modification. So you can do it this way. All right, same exact view. It's the same exact view. Okay, so we're, again, we're evaluating the, uh, the scapulohumeral joint. Okay, here's another one. This is the inferior superior axial projection, also known as the Clements modification. I don't know why in the world you would do something like this. It just looks really complicated, but there it is. <laughs> is and it too? So, so now he has credit for inventing this move, and he gets to put his name on there. Is it two views, though, or is it? It's just one view. How come one's angled and one's? They're just showing different projections of one of one that can't fully extend their arm. Oh. Yeah, it's the same view. Okay. Same view. Okay, same results. Okay, there's another one. Superior infrared axial projection. Same, same thing. You get the same results. I'm showing you guys this because this is a common position at St. Jude's and a couple of the other facilities. So they don't do the info superior. They don't do Haas, but they do this. And this is why this is included. I don't think this is in your book, is it? I don't think it is. You don't have to look up. <coughs> okay. But you, you're seeing the patient down. Their arm and the body is going to form about a 90 degree angle. Angle. You're going to place the image receptor underneath their armpit. But what's the issue here, guys? Magnification. Void. Void. Okay. Void. Increase OID. So there is going to be some magnification. And anytime you have magnification, what happens to detail? There's going to be a loss of detail, okay? So what they may do is to compensate for that OID, they're going to increase their SID. So they may go from 40 inches to maybe 50 or 55. You guys know that, right? To compensate for OID, you can increase your SID. Okay? 
to compensate for OID, you can increase your SID. So as the patient's leaning over, he's gonna, they're gonna tilt their head, okay? And angle about five to 15 degrees, this will help open up the scapulohumeral joint.